Hey everyone, this is Brian from Big Top Gaming, and I just wanted to preface this video with the idea that, or not the idea, just wanted to like state my case. So I haven't added any images or anything else like that. This is more of like a YouTube podcast type situation. So uh, there were a ton of things that I wanted to do with this video, but the length of our discussion and my overall like non-investment in War Machine at this moment until the 21st has been a little bit down enough to where I don't want to edit this for the the images to put into the video to give you something to kind of reference. Um, so I'm real sorry for that, and I'm sure many of you are going to be very upset about that. But, uh, you know, as soon as the 21st rolls around, which is, uh, you know, three days from when I'm recording this, Ethan and I are going to deep super dive, or <laughs> I'm sorry, dive super deep into all of the fancy new rules that will be coming out for us, all the new adjustments to units, and uh, we'll be digging right back into War Machine like we never left it. Uh, not that we ever did, we just kind of put it on hiatus for a little bit. So uh, I hope that you enjoy having YouTube videos on in your background while you're working or doing whatever it is you do with your life, and you can listen to the rest of this video and uh, listen to uh, Ethan's recap of the Riverfront Rumble. Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name's Brian. And I'm Ethan. And today we're going to do a recap of the Riverfront Rumble. It was a uh, War Machine Weekend qualifier event that took place on September 26th? Something like that. Something? I'm going to click on my calendar here and just make sure. 25th. 25th. So September 25th, this happened in... Uh, I forget the name of the city, but it's in it's just outside the Twin Cities. It's uh, in White Minneapolis, Bear. White Bear, Min Minnesota, sorry. And uh, it was at the Battleground Cafe, and uh, they have a pretty legit story. The The last uh, battle, or not battle report, but the tournament recap that we had done uh, was was the, the same place. So they have tons of tables and uh, tons of space. They've got a, a good amount of stock uh, for... Uh, a ton of different war games, uh, especially like the 40k and AOS stuff, but um, they they're just a, a really legit store, and uh, I think that they the people there who uh, run the uh, events do a really good job with it, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to to talking about how it went. So for me, I had intended to play my Bennett and Lucas list from the, the last event that I had. I, I just really felt comfortable with the pairing and thought that it would do good in the in the meta that I was maybe going to be going into. I, I thought about waffling about... I, I, well, I waffled about dropping Bennett and picking up uh, Baldwin instead since I know the Minneap or Minnesota... Air, that, that Twin City area has like a, a ton, a ton of ret. But um, unfortunately, I was off on a leadership retreat and we got to go do our finding ourselves hike and uh, I misjudged my ability to stick a landing and fell on some rocks and busted my ribs and my ankles up a little bit so uh, I opted not to go to the riverfront rumble uh, but Ethan sure did so Ethan uh, what what did you decide to bring with you this time so uh, I didn't have my pairing figured out until the night before the event Mm -hmm. because I've been going back and forth for like the last couple of weeks. Like I had minions list and this is me air quoting minions because it was troll warlocks as minion casters and vengeance of Dunia. As a joke, I had like Kador list, uh, Menoth list. I ended up playing Menoth and I brought Harbinger in faithful masses paired with Resnick two in warriors of the old faith. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, when I when I woke up the the morning that you had left for Riverfront Rumble, you must have been in quite the hurry because you left all of my cases open. Um, well, not all of them, the one that you were in. But uh, I I think we 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 kind of talked about how we could kind of at least you and I talked about how we could make a, a decent Kador pairing with Resnick two in it and. Uh, I think uh, after a while, I was just like, well, why don't you just play Protectorate instead? And Harbinger's pretty good, still pretty good, and yeah. will continue to be good. So um, that that's just kind of what you decided to set yourself up for. What was the motivation behind Resnick 2 mostly? Because I, I know most people are going to understand why you would want to play Harbinger. Uh, Resnick 2, when we went to Minnesota for the last like event where you did the recap, I actually played Resnick 2 in Kador, and it, it's my belief... Resnick 2 in Worries of the Old Faith is uh, Kador's best ret answer. 
And like he doesn't seem like it on paper, but like he's just super legit in a ret. And then like you said, like why not just play him in Menoth? So then I was like, I was playing around with Menoth casters. Like I had a Serenia list. I even made a Res One list just for the lulls because I was like, well, if I'm just going alone to drive myself and just mess around, because I wasn't planning on like placing or doing well because we I'm just so out of practice. I was just like, well, Harby's easy. I can play it. And I think I got Res Two down. I've played a whole three games with him before this event so i'm like that's I, enough i got this yeah he's super easy that's definitely enough to to feel like you're you're specialized in that caster at that moment so um the the tournament started like early-ish right like nine or eight yeah we were supposed to start at eight thirty. we were a little bit behind yeah i gave the judges some grief but no we, we started pretty promptly sure well like you you can only expect so much from people who didn't even know who was going to be judging the event until uh 36 hours beforehand so you know gotta bust their chops a little bit um so what was your first round opponent or not what was your opponent but who like what was the the faction you got dropped into uh, so round one, I got paired into Jacob from the Eau Claire meta, and he was playing Signar. He had Nemo 3 and Storm Division paired with Siege 1 Trenchers. Uh, Siege 1 Trenchers sounds interesting, but um, you know, I imagine the Nemo list was probably our what we're mostly used to seeing, where it's like Nemo, a couple Storm Striders, and maybe another 120 or Dynamo and some stuff. Yeah, it had like uh, a couple heavies, a minion of Storm Lances, a Costa, Gwen, two Storm Striders pretty and a couple fireflies with one on the junior so like not out of the realm of normal that's not an abnormal nemo list but there was a few like tweaks here and there like yeah like think the like super one, solos yeah i think one like one of the heavies was like a reliant Which that just got buffed in sense. storm division so like a few things i got buffed a few things that were already good with nemo so what scenario did you uh, end up getting into recon two. Ooh, that's a fun one it is super fun um Especially when your opponent's got two battle engines. So, uh, you you, what was your thought process for what to drop into this? Well, when I looked at this pairing, I was like, I thought Harby was the re- like was the better call because like she can s- strip all the upkeeps, which Signar doesn't appreciate. She can she still has the awe bubble, and I can still redirect uh, Elips away from Nemo if I just position shield guards right. Mm -hmm. And then into trenchers, I can basically feet and say, you can't come into my zone for a turn. But I was just worried, like there wasn't really a good hiding spot for her. And like, I had just driven three hours after sleeping four hours. I was like, there's, there is nothing else I'd rather not do that early in the morning than play Harvey round one. Cause I know it's going to be a two hour grind. So I dropped Resnick. Yeah, well, that's not a bad thing to, not a bad uh, mindset to adopt because, like, if you're, if you're, you know, not mentally ready for the type of attrition game that Harbinger plays, then uh, you you just got to do what's more comfortable for you. So, um, it was, I imagine, then it was uh, Nemo three into uh, Resnick two. Yep, he dropped Re- Nemo, and I won the roll with Resnick. Yeah, which is, uh, oh wait, no, you don't get the reroll. Oh yeah, you, you do. do get a Never mind. I was Warriors. just like. I just was not thinking straight. Well, my Harvey list has Anastasia, so she gets plus one. Yeah. And then Resnick gets rerolls from Warriors, so like I get a little bit of advantage either way. Mm-hmm. Which is nice to have against Nemo, since he you kind of draw the line of engagement pretty early then. So, um, how like let's kind of we don't have to go through turn by turn, but like kind of how did the game evolve? What were some big moments during the game, and and how did it pan out for you? Uh, so some big turns were basically me just coming up and finding landing spots for the victor and the gun carriage just because there was a lot of woods, a few buildings, and quicksand on my side of the board. Luckily, there was enough gap. Sadly, like, I didn't think about taking enough pictures because I didn't think, we, like, it didn't even cross my mind that we might be doing a recap. But, like, so I don't have a good picture of it. But, like, there was a gap between a forest and the quicksand that kind of Resnick and the victor got smashed into because like that quicksand was totally hosing me on that side. Yeah. And I couldn't go anywhere near it. Well, you, you, that's the the bummer about quicksand, right? Is like, even though you're on a huge base and your leg probably goes deeper than the sand hole does, you somehow get screwed by it. Yeah. Like I really don't think quicksand should work on one twenties, but that's a different debate. Yeah, I know we could get into so many debates about this new terrain business, but um, so what were what were some of the points? I know when we were talking about it back and forth, you you kind of had some uh, 
some back and forth, good plays, bad plays. I think you made a couple mistakes at some point. Was there any, um, what were some of the big crowning moments during the game? Uh, so for me, like one of the few big things right away is when I was able to send in the gun carriage into one of the fireflies and kind of just like impact attack, smite it out of the way. And then that let me shoot a couple pie plates onto his heavies with the AOE four rough terrain. Cause like he didn't take pathfinder. He took magical objectives and I took something that didn't matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you were get, you were griefing yourself about not taking the, an objective that actually would have helped you. I mean, there wasn't really anything to do on that side of the table you put me on, so like I don't even remember what the objective yeah, was. It might have been a different game than that I'm thinking of. It was a different game. Uh, so I was able to pop rough terrain on his heavies, so basically I got to put Scourge of Heresy up, kind of tone the zone, tuck behind the woods, and like immune to non-magical shooting, so like he couldn't really get the heavies on him. There was one battle engine in range of the objective, so really he could get one shot, maybe two, from the battle engine because I had a hermit nearby. Mm-hmm. So like if he wanted to go for a big play, he could. And I did, like the victor kind of held back, so that way he had to choose whether he wanted the feet on my battle engine and just kind of get limited work done, which is what he ended up doing. He feeded to kill my battle engine, and then that's really all he killed that turn because the army was so spaced out. And the victor wasn't even in the feet. Yeah. So um, sounds like a pretty uh, rough Nemo feat turn for just being able to pull one battle engine off and leaving your the rest of your stuff pretty okay. Yeah, but like he needed it to get the battle engine out of the right zone because mm-hmm. there's really nothing over there that could kill it without the feet. Yeah. Like the feet did work because it had 40 boxes going in or it was full health, 38, and he was able to whittle it down. It's just like he had the choose because then... If he didn't kill the battle engine, I'm just putting rough terrain on his heavies every turn, and then, like, his heavies don't get to do anything. Yeah, they're just stuck. Yeah. So, um, the, the when did, did you, when you were going through the game, at what point did you start to actually start taking out some of the Storm Striders? Uh, I killed the first Storm Strider on turn three, I think. I believe it was the turn after he feeded. I was able to Boundless Charge of Victor battle it for good measure because there was like some other stuff near his flag and i was able to charge in and basically two shot a storm strider at dice plus six yeah because like i always casually forget their ps 23 and then battle yeah they're the victor is a nasty nasty jack when you get it into close combat i mean matt six but what can you do yeah you can curse stuff yeah you can and then hopefully maybe it'll be in the buffs yep uh but yeah he's able to punch And kind of clear the left zone. So that was able to get me a couple points up. So I was able to go up, I want to say like 3-0. Maybe maybe 3-1 because I think he scored his flag the turn before on bottom of two. Mm -hmm. Just because that side, the victor's so slow, it can't really contest. And then, uh, yeah, he like punched a couple things, cleared his flag. Or I cleared his flag. And I believe I tried to get a Menite Archon onto his flag to score it. So I was able to score, like, my flag, his zone, but then, like, my charge lane, I didn't have enough room to, like, land on it. So it was kind of wonky there. And then the, his turn and that turn, I was able to get a Scourge of Heresy with Boundless Charge into his heavies, and he didn't realize Scourge has purgation, purgation on his sword, and he upkept both of his arm buffs. And then, like, partway through his turn, he had asked what Scourge, like, like, after he moved his heavies, he was asking about Scourge, and I was like, well, he has a purgation sword, and because his shooting had crippled, uh, he shot, and he crippled his flail, and I was like, well, that's the weak arm, he's still got his purgation sword, and he's like, he's got purgation, and I was like, yeah, I'm sorry, I thought you knew, and, like, his heavies had been in lamentation range, so the junior only had one focus left, because it had cost two to upkeep, so he couldn't cycle Arcane Shield to get it off of him. Yeah, and with spell piercer purgation, scourge got to live the dream in one round of heavy, and then kind of half health another. Yeah, it seems like something that is—it's just a an honest mistake. I, I think a lot of people haven't really played against Resnick two in general, and I think from what I understand in the Eau Claire meta, at least there's only one protectorate player that is a like in quotes a full time protectorate. But I think they've moved over to Mercs recently. So like, first of all, I don't think. You know, when when Resnick 2 first came out, I think people were like, okay, he's he's neat. But, like, the, it was a different time back then. And when uh, the Judicator got its big old buff um, for signs of importance all the time with its reliquary, 
then people started playing with him a little bit just to get spell piercer out there but i think after that period the the resnick 2 kind of dropped off the radar and scourge of heresy is definitely not something you see with anyone other than him and you weren't seeing resnick 2 at all after mark 3 happened in my opinion so it's not um it's not uncommon for someone to think that like oh yeah i'm gonna put their they just kind of work in their own little zone and put up their buffs and keep them on there because that's their normal thing what they need to do but um when you're playing against protectorate if you don't know the army the one thing you should always keep in mind is almost every single caster and almost and at least every single list has something that can mess with your spells yep everything's got spell denial somehow yeah whether it's purgation dispel purification no spells from the choir like all the fun stuff yeah so um how did the game end up for you i know that there were a couple moments where things got a little heated you might have made a couple mistakes here and there uh he was able to one round the victor that went in that was full health like uh he killed scourge and then he went over and he just rolled phenomenally like he rolled an 11 about three or four times in a row for damage on the victor with electrify so he was like dice minus one and he like he took out half of his health more than half of his health with a half crippled jack and then a costa charged and then a stormlance charge so then it was like it did come down to the last like stormlance charge but he was able to kill the victor so now all of a sudden like that side collapsed scourge was gone so like I was kind of out of heavy hitters besides Resnick. Yeah. So then he was able to score. Uh, he wasn't able to get a solo on his flag because he had the charge. So I still had a scenario lead. So I was still three to one. So I had to try and push for scenario. So I, like Resnick got real frisky. <laughs> he ba- He had to charge the objective. I believe I had the boundless charge myself too because like I was base to base with my objective. So I'm speed seven, I charge 10, threaten 12, and the objectives are 12 inches apart. So no, actually I didn't boundless charge myself. I had to charge the objective, spell piercer it, or put spell piercer up because he cycled arcane shield to his half health storm strider in the zone. And then I put a, I think I double tap the objective because he's a, just a pal 14 weapon master. Yeah, just casually. You forget how like big that guy hits. Mm-hmm. And then he put a boosted flesh is weak into the battle engine didn't break armor and like the turn before this i had charged one of my midnight archons into one the storm started that the victor didn't kill and like he spiked the charge without uh righteous fury or righteous vengeance proc so i was like okay i just need a midnight archon to want like do good and then it charged barely did any damage and it came down to me rolling the second attack at dice minus uh well, Storm Surgers are 19 base. I'd spell Piercer up, and he was in Hermit Aura. So, like, I was effectively dice minus two. Yeah. Something like that. And, like, he had to spike it. And, I like, I sat there before I rolled because, like, if I fail this, Nemo, Nemo's going to kill me because Resnick's on zero camp, mm-hmm. staring down a half health heavy and Nemo and a Storm Strider. Yeah, that'll not be good at all. But Manet Archon cranked the roll, and I was able to score three that turn and go up six to one. Yeah, better lucky than good, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, you, you're getting the, the rush shaken off here. So let's go into round two. What did you get paired into this time? Round two, I got paired into Jeff, who is a Minnesota local, who I actually haven't gotten the chance to play into since I was playing Circle a couple years ago. Like the last time I brought Malsar to an event, mm-hmm. like that's how long ago. And he was playing Cole Grimma, Storm of the North, paired with Jarl, Storm of the North. Okay. That's that's a pairing, I guess. Uh, he asked on the the Facebook group for Minnesota because he didn't know what he wanted to play, and someone's like Yarl, so a bunch of people voted Yarl. So he just wanted to play some games, have some fun, and he ended up dropping Cole Grimma into me on what scenario was it? King of the Hill, and I dropped Harby because I was like, okay, it's time to get the rust off. You're seeing trolls with no gunny too. You're getting Harby. Yeah, no, that the like Cole Grimma is a phenomenal warlock for trolls, and I also think that Yarl and Storm of the North, and we, I, we've talked about it before, that I think that that is probably like the the theme that saved Yarl from being in the bottom of the pile forever. But like you're pairing two casters together that both kind of leverage clouds to get a lot done, and they. It seems to me, at least, that they function kind of similarly, where 
Jarl is a little bit more aggressive with things and Kogrim is a little bit more defensive and controlly. So I guess like maybe it works out in my little theory that like, um, you know, you bring two lists that do similar things and then you can kind of predict what your opponent needs to drop into them. But when you're bringing two things that are like more solvable and that would be clouds, um, I don't know if that works out so well. I'm not sure. Like, I thought I was getting Cole Grimma, which she did drop, mm-hmm. just because it's been a hot minute since I've seen Jarl. Uh, but well, and with the with the sprays for days, like he, she doesn't care about Paladin so much unless they're base to base, which she would care about that a little bit. And it's more of like, even though like I have a Devout in Harvey's list, so she could become spell immune. It doesn't stop him from just spraying his own dude and trivially killing Harvey. So like, yeah, I knew like Harvey wasn't going to be safe. But I didn't think Res 2 had the meat to chew through Weapon Masters and Bears and then just dealing with Cole Grimma shenanigans of like feeding and basically taking him out of the game for a turn. Yeah. Whereas Harvey, I could kind of just slow roll it and there was a nice forest in the middle that I could hide Harvey behind. Yeah, you're just living for the grind. So um, what scenario did you get? Uh, we played King of the Hill. Okay, that's not that's an interesting one for any Storm of the North list because you can just rock uh the like you want to play wide on this scenario and that's what the bears like so did he did he have bumbles in both lists yes yeah i mean like that's you just do double double bears and bumbles and like this scenario seems really good for you i might be misremembering maybe his yarl list wasn't in storm in the north but like he legit had bumbles boomy three and double bears in cold grimma and that's what was like scaring me the most yeah. in that scenario mm-hmm. The, the reason why I like Jarl so much in Storm is because he has so many upkeeps that he wants to have, and he can just upkeep them for free on Northkin models, which is really a big deal. Yep. So um, I know we, we're, we're about 20 minutes in roughly, so let's kind of do the, the elevator, not an elevator pitch. What were some of the highlights of the game for like you know a good play on your part or theirs? Uh, I think a good play on my part was trying to mitigate uh, her feet. I was putting sturdy models in the zone so like i had the pony paladins in each zone so he couldn't feed and push me out because they're sturdy i had a unit of initiates two units of initiates actually in the zone within four inches of the flag in the middle because that way when they're base to base they can't be pushed so that way i couldn't just trivially lose on scenario because i always forget about the flag in the middle yeah and like that's always something an opponent gets me on that scenario so i was like Mm -hmm. i'm not gonna just give them a free point and one of the mistakes I made when we sat down was like there was a bunch of rough terrain by my objective. And I was like, oh, I'll just take rough terrain. And then like he was doing his turn one. I was like, wait, yeah, you, this is you cold. Took path, you took Pathfinder, but not the eyeless sight objective. And I even ran stuff to not be within four of my objective. Like that was like yeah. my turn one was super sloppy. Like my picking objective and then just running up. And I was like, I didn't even put this paladin within four of the objectives, so I can't charge through some water on the other side of the zone. Yeah, if I recall, when you were playing this game, I was in the ER and waiting for some x-ray results or something, and it was like, I kept wondering if he was going to feat with Cole Grimma yet. And I think he slow rolled that feat until like bottom of three or top of three. Bottom of three. Neither of us feated until turn Mm -hmm. three. Yeah. Or, like, I think he feeded bottom of three, I feeded top of four. Like, we were both just holding on to our feet and kind of dancing around the middle. But since, like, he, there was a forest on his side, too, so he was, like, kind of cloud walling it off from it. So I couldn't really do anything. But he couldn't really do anything to me. Like, he sent in bumbles, but under awe and uh, not set defense, but uh, Ashenvale, like, bumbles just missed all of his attacks. Yeah. He still got to return, or he still got to hoof it away. Uh, without free strikes but then like he just couldn't really do anything so i was fine just feeding and waiting Mm -hmm. and he didn't really have anything on the flanks like the bears ambushed i put a heavy on each end not in the zones just to lure the bears out of the zones so then like i was able to kind of clear his objective and then start to kind of score like i got a couple points like i cleared the zones the squares because the circle wasn't going anywhere and just scored a couple points and i was like okay let's do this and then we just grinded from there, and then we feeded late, just because like he feeded the push Harvey kind of out of martyrdom range of stuff, mm-hmm. and I actually didn't martyrdom once that game. Yeah, I was gonna ask if you got a chance to do that at all, but it sounds like things were pretty uh, grindy in a like more reserved way instead of like a real fighty way. 
Yeah, because like Harvey, I was so scared of her coming out from behind the woods. Because I'm like, if she comes out more than three inches into the woods, I'm going to get sprayed to death. Yeah. So I was like, I got to hide behind the woods, but I had to put initiates in the zone so that way they couldn't be pushed out so I could contest. So when he feeded and pushed Harvey back, I was like, oh, I'm not really in range. But like, I still had a Menite up there. So like, he only killed a handful of models on the turn I feeded because he feeded after me. Yeah. No. I honestly can't remember who feeded first. It was like a turn three, four feet. Yeah. But like he pushed me out of Marlin, but I was able just to get up on scenario because I scored those couple early points, like the turn three points from his objective in the zone. So like it just kind of, we grinded out to turn seven. So then how did that game end out then? So I was able to win turn seven with like 30 seconds on my clock. Harvey just literally ran away from Cole Grimma. Like I cleared the bears on one side and I was like, Harvey's fucking booking it that way. Yeah. And, like, just got as far away from Colgrim as I could. Now, I recall, I think this was the game where you had put your Devout in a very interesting position. No, this was not the game? No. All right. Well, let's go on to round three then. So far, you're 2-0, and oh, looking pretty good for Team Bearboo. Yeah, I know. But then we had the lunch, so I got to, like, okay, I finally get to unwind. Because, like, both my games almost came down the clock. The Harvey one did. Resonance yeah. was pretty close. I was almost clocked. And so I was like, I needed that break. You're not used to games that last more than a half hour. No, like if I haven't won by turn three, it's just like I'm mentally exhausted. Yeah, it's like we you don't exist past turn three. Like you just, your brain shuts off. Mm-hmm. So after lunch, you, you've you been refueled. Did you eat at the, the meat market? They ordered sandwiches and stuff that we could buy from the meat market. And they were gotcha. pretty good. Nice. So the meat market next door to the Battleground Cafe is a pretty legit place. Oh, I, I love it. I love the store. I love the new location. I love going there. Yeah. You just love, love, love. I love Battleground, man. Love it, man. That was my favorite store when I was up in the area. Yep. I, I think when you look at, like, it, they definitely, for those that are familiar with the Wisconsin area, um, they definitely do rival the the look and investment in aesthetic that Noble Knight does. So, like, Noble Knight spends a lot of, a lot of effort into making their store look nice. But I think Battlegrounds Cafe just has this really nice rustic look and everything functions really well there. You know what I mean? Like the flow of the store is really nice. Yeah, it's got a large play area. Like their old store was kind of smaller, so it was kind of cramped. Mm -hmm. But like this one's super wide open and like you're not, you don't feel like you're standing next to the people next to you playing games. Like there's at least space for you to breathe. Yeah, it's, it's a nice, nice setup they've got. So into round three, you're undefeated. 2-0, and oh, I wouldn't say that's undefeated. undefeated. Like, that's not, that so, doesn't sound as impressive. You beat one Minnesota person. As far as I'm concerned, they're probably the best War Machine players in the Midwest. Outside of Baraboo. Oh, yeah, of course. Outside us. Yeah. Because we're so good. We are. Uh, round three, I got paired into David from the Minnesota WTC team, and he was playing Gore Shade 4 paired with Issy. And we got paired yep, up. Shocker on, of the century. Yeah, I know. It's such a good pairing. Uh, we were playing on Bunkers, and this is where my super secret Res 2 tech comes in. And Bunkers is two flags now, right? Not three? Uh, yep, just two flags. Yep, no more middle flag. Uh, or is it the other way around? I honestly can't remember. I'd have I, want, to pull I up. feel like it's only two flags now, but... Maybe we could just look it up. We could, but I'm not going to. Okay. You uh, leave that for <clears throat> the comments so so people can comment on it and then bump our algorithm up a little bit so that we become fancy i mean if you just want to be lazy sure yeah let's do it uh so he dropped gore shade mm -hmm. and i guess i didn't really talk about what makes the res 2 list so good into red yeah this is your this is your moment to shine i know like i'm really proud of this list and i'm proud like of res 2 into red. so the big thing is his feet and spell piercer and the fact he can get choir access on a victor because i think a victor is very big in yep. the Kador mat, in the especially when you're playing in Kador, into the rep matchup because you need a way to make sure your colossal isn't just screwed over by blinding light. Yes, and you always need to account for Issy because like you can't have a 34 point paperweight. Yep. And the big thing with Res two, if you don't know his feet, I'm just gonna read it. We can even post a picture on it because yeah, we'll pull the picture up. It's wordy. Uh, when an enemy model is boxed by a melee or ranged attack in Resnix control area, center a four inch AOE on the box model. Then remove that model from play. Enemy models in the AOE are hit and suffer an unboostable PAL-14 fire damage roll. This damage is not considered to have been caused by an attack. 
Purge the Faithless lasts for one round. So the big thing is that feat shuts down Gore Shade's feat 100%, except for the stationary part, which I do have a thread checking on the forums, and I'd asked the TO the week before how they wanted to rule it because there's a, some debate whether the model that does the attack is RFPing it, or if since Resnick 2's feet is the one that's triggering the RFP, if he's the one that's removing it. So, like, say a Mennite Archon punches a Ryovasta vendor under four shade feet. It's boxed. It then gets RFP'd. So who do you think remo- uh, counts as being removing the model from play? I'm very firm in the, in the camp of Resnick is the one that's causing the model to be removed from play. So uh, the that would mean that um, the negative side effects of Gorshade's feet do not apply. Um, well, they do. I mean, they just make Resnick stationary, which he can't be made stationary. So, like that's that. My take on it is that Resnick 2's feet is the one removing it, so he would be the one removing the model. Correct, and that's how I interpret it. But then that's how the TO did. But then a few days later, he went the opposite way, just for consistency, because I think he referenced like Shatterstorm, but I. I was fine with whatever way he ruled it. I just wanted to ask before the event instead of the day of because, Mm -hmm. like, I hate doing that to TOs on tricky rules interactions. Like, I don't want you to have to try and debate this philosophy. Unless thirty minutes during our games, yeah, then I'll (laughs) fuck around and ask him rules questions all the time. Uh, So the big thing is, even without with that not working, is that the model boxed is RFP'd and before Gorshade gets the soul. So mm-hmm. no soul for Gorshade. If they're playing Ryavas Defenders, if they're RFP on box, the RFP triggers before Dying Breath, so they don't get the Dying Breath attack. And since like since I have a Victor in the list, everyone knows it shoots continuous fire AoEs, so typically you don't clump infantry, but Ryavas still want to be grouped together for steady yep. or for D-line, so they usually do pods of two. The fact that the feet RFPs the model and then puts down the AoE means that when the damage happens, which is not blast, so Ryavas are not immune, they are not base to base with another model if they're only in pods of two. So that way they don't get to get just steady, no knockdown tough. Yeah. It's pretty pretty cute. Um, I think that it is a it is a good list for headhunting Rhett, and like if you're ever going to a Minnesota event, like that that should be the list you play if, as long as that ruling sticks. Well, I mean, even if it doesn't, the reason why the the big reason why the gun carriage is in the list is because it's a huge base immune to the stationary. Yeah. If if when he had ruled the, the other way, where it was Res two RFPing the model and not the model making the attack, I think I was debating like swapping out for some dragoons or some ponies. Just for more volume of attacks from different angles. Yeah. Because as it is with the gun carriage, it still gets uh, every impact attack it can make along the way. It just gets really hard to position it and try to factor in where is it impact attacking along its line, especially when you boundless charge it. Yeah. Because all of a sudden then it's charging speed 8, charges 11, charges 13 inches, and you're trying to map out a straight line of every time it's going to contact a model because it impact attacks multiple times. Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets kind of tricky. So I think that's pretty much the gist of it from why it's good. Oh, and the Victor AoEs, of course. Like, if they do clump up the Ryavas, you can just shoot out fire AoEs, big pie plates of AoE 5, and then just set stuff on fire to not trigger, like, his feet or to maybe just make them do continuous effects and try the kill models before the lines engage because of this range 20. Yeah. And that's the thing about the range on that vector is that if they do happen to drop uh mage hunters into you, the, I, I can't remember exactly if you can reach them on turn one with the drift, but I feel like you can, you can as long you, as they deploy right at the line. Yeah. And you have to drift in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Whereas say like, uh, at the last event, I paired Res 2 with uh, Harkovich double victor. Harkovich double victor can drift it from the AD line because yeah, he can they run, run and run then broadside. broadside. But when you're only speed 4, you got to drift in a good direction. Yep. And uh, Shadows was kind of like my number one fear. Because I was like, Resnick's on a huge base. All their guns are magical, but I have four shield guards. So Falseer, Shadows, stay away. Yeah. Stay away, stay away. Okay, so... um. 
where the heck were we? So we we who you you played into Dave. He dropped Gorshade. You dropped Resnick. You felt like you were favored into the matchup. I felt like it was playable. I did not feel favored because he won the roll to go first. Okay, so um, your re roll didn't help you out there. No, I even re rolled it three times as a joke and still lost each time. Yeah, that's just because I was like, this one doesn't count. And I when it rolled, I was like, this one doesn't count. When it rains, it pours, right? Yeah. So, um, how did uh, once the lines kind of connected? How did 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 the list work the way you thought it was going to? Partially, yes. Like he had one unit of wardens two Ryavas units and a Death Archon. So like I was able to just kind of do some work. Resnick was able to punch stuff and kill it and explode it. And then, of course, he's immune to stationary. So then he could just kind of repo away. So he was able to kill a few models. The Victor was punching a couple models because since he won the roll and I ran first. I know he, he won the roll. He ran up. I walked and shot with the Victor turn one, which I hate doing with a Colossal. Yeah. But when you have that many dudes, like... I needed to try and remove models before the feet could go off. Mm -hmm. So, like, I set a bunch of stuff on fire turn one. I think, like, five or six models. Fun fact, four of them went out. One of them stayed on the Chimera, and the other one toughed. So that was sad. Uh, So, and then the Menites were punching stuff, like, but they're Thresher, so they were killing a bunch of models. They sadly were stationary then. But, like, if they weren't, like, things would be going super great. Yeah. And then... Soup, something super fun happened with the gun carriage, which took four judges and 10 minutes of rules discussion. Uh, on top of like this activation for my gun carriage, legit took 30 minutes. On t- like, and this includes me doing the attacks, doing the movement, and having a judge come over to do the measurements because I was trying to charge with boundless charge in between a building and a wall to try and impact attack as many Ryavas as I could. So I couldn't clip the wall. Like I couldn't make an impact attack while on the wall. And we needed to line up the angle to make sure I'm going in the correct path to see how many models I'm impact attacking each time. Because like if you screw up the angle and I say like he had the the Ryavas in pairs of two, say I only clip one of the Ryavas and I don't get both of them in the impact attack. If that one toughs, I'm screwed and like my activation ends. But if I can hit two of them at the same time, that doubles my odds of him failing a tough check, which lets me keep going. Because as long as one of them fails the tough check, like I I have a good chance of keep going because the explosion on the next guy is an auto tough. Yep. And then so like he has to keep making tough checks. Mm-hmm. So what happened was like just lining all that up took forever. We got a judge. We figured out, okay, I need boundless charge to get through all these dudes because measuring a huge base impact attacking through a bunch of other models is such a nightmare if you're not on war table and like maybe we'll get a picture of the show because like but what happened was i was impact attacking killing a few models and i took a couple free strikes which like he was spiking he did uh i think he almost half held it from free strikes alone just because the angles or like a model tough that was like out of the way because like i hit miles in front of me but then there was a model like to the side of me I was able to impact attack on that toughed. So it was and it was still base to base with somebody out of melee range, so it was still steady. But what happened was eventually I was getting towards my charge target. Like nobody in the front had failed. Like the explosions just killing people, clearing a path. Life is good for Ethan. I get to the models in front of my charge target. I hit them. I kill them. They explode. And then the AoE clips my charge target and he fails his tough check. So then we had to look up what happens if you kill your charge target with a non-impact attack before you get into melee with it. Because I was not in melee with my charge target. My charge target was no longer alive. So therefore, I fail my charge. I, I just go infinite distance until my movement ends, and then I fail my charge because there's no one left for me to end my movement in melee with. Correct, yeah. And it took like four judges, including Travis, because Travis tried telling me something this Travis get the f away from me you're not the judge because <laughs> you're telling me what I don't want to hear yeah let me listen to the actual to so that was super fun yeah now that that sounds like a like the kind of moment you live for but it seemed like it didn't go quite quite great for you what pissed me off more is that I didn't plan it like I yeah. like bringing up like weird rules interactions and having discussions about them like if Kogan smites a mile that's on top of himself under the free strike does he kill himself mm-hmm. or does a Storm Raptor with somebody toughing under it makes it teleport. 
Like I got the basic rule book change. Like that was fun for me. Yeah. Uh, but like a model killing its charge target with a non-impact attack before it reaches melee just legit doesn't happen. Well, you, unless you're res two. <laughs> yeah, you probably got a war machine first over here. That was super fun. Yeah. Uh, but that cost me the gun carriage's activation on that side because I couldn't shoot. Yep. And I couldn't kill support. But like I was doing work, but I wasn't doing it fast enough. Like it just mm-hmm. takes so long to fight him, to plan out how I'm gonna kill models under his feet, where does Resnick have to go so he doesn't die? And like the fact he won the roll to go first meant he ran turn one, he ran, got a couple charges off. I think to get Scourge up the board, I had to boundless charge him because he charges faster than he runs. Yeah. But that put him in charge range of two wardens because they're just so fast. And like I had to try and position Resnick where he wouldn't just die. Turn t- or yeah, die top of three to just wardens charging him at dice minus two mm-hmm. or like Ryavos getting on him. So, like, I had it just took so long to measure stuff out and then trying to play around the feet with the models actually being stationary instead of Resnick just took forever. Yeah, it sounds sounds rough. So, I imagine that game did not go well for you. No, it came down to I was eventually starting to clear stuff, but I was just so low on clock, he was just going to grind me out. Do you think that if you would have had like maybe another 10, 15 minutes, you probably could have pulled it out or would it have not mattered so much? Mm, probably wouldn't have mattered so much just because there was still like miles left. Gorshe was still around. Like he was still doing his shenanigans mm-hmm. and like I just couldn't contest deep. And like he was able to eventually like clear off the right flag and start scoring. And then like that side kind of collapsed because. Like, uh, Scourge went up, threshered under feet, boosted some damage rolls, exploded a bunch of models, but then got stationary, so then he basically auto-died to survivor charges, the gun carriage went down, and, like, his wardens, fuck those things. Yeah, they're bad. No, he critted eight fucking attack rolls in a row between his wardens and executioners. Like, his first attack roll of the game, Scythe rolled Snake Eyes to shoot my gun carriage. It's like, things are looking up, Ethan. Yep. And then he, like, got a couple warden charges. He's like, oh, double four. And they rolled again for the next one. Up, oh, double five and half held uh, Scourge and took out his purgation sword. And I was like, you son of a bitch. And then he just kept doing it. Not that it mattered. Like, he was punching, like, Menite Archons yeah. or punching, like, other stuff that didn't matter for the crit. But it's the fact he kept critting. Mm-hmm. I was like, David, you got to stop this, man. Crit I'm going to flip this table. Yep. Crit happens. Crit happens. So now you're going into round four. You're two and one. You just, things are still looking fine. You know, hopefully you're going to go into someone else who's who's gone down a game two. So um, what would you get paired into for round four? Round four, I got paired into Trevor playing Gorshade and a C. Nice. <laughs> the so, same pairing yeah. back yep. to back. Yep. And they've, they've both played those lists quite a bit. So they're well practiced with them. And, like, surprise, surprise, I dropped Res 2. Yeah. He dropped Gorshade. His Gorshade list was uh, double Wardens, double Ryavas. So more dudes, more bodies, mm-hmm. but no Death Archon. And, like, I think uh, he might have... No, it was the other list. And he had, like, a Hydra for Arcane Vortex. So, like, a, a few differences. More bodies, a little bit different Jack Loda, but still, like, the basic double Chimera play. Yeah. And, like... Uh, I think I had talked with him previously about how like Res Two plays in the Gore Shade, but then like he hadn't seen it, and I don't think he heard me like yelling because I was just yelling during my last game because it was you were you were at that point. No, it was more of like a funny yelling. I was like, "Are you yeah. fucking me with this gun carriage failing mm-hmm. its charge because it kills a model that's not in his melee range?" Uh, and I was just having fun with it. So we had to play the same matchup, yep, back to back, and I lost the roll again. Mm-hmm. So basically, he ran forward and this was on not bunkers yeah because bunkers was the last round this was spread the net so it had that deep rectangle so i'm like man i'm not gonna be able to contest that because he just ran ran again and feeded and just jammed me with ryavas yeah so it was kind of like the same thing as last game but more bodies the chew through Mm -hmm. so i just had to keep making attacks making attacks making attacks and then, like, just RFPing. I did get to do something cute, which I haven't done since, like, Mark II with, like, more of one feet. Like, the holy hand grenade trick. He jammed the victor with wardens, 
So I two-handed threw one away, and it landed in a clump of Ryovas, and since it died to a melee attack, because throws are melee attacks, it exploded under my feet. So, like, that was cute. Yeah. But then that still meant, like, there's four other wardens on that side, because that took all my focus. Exactly, yeah. It was the one, the one thing you could do, so. And then my gun carriage failed to kill on its first attack, so it ended its activation after, again, like, I, I called a judge, I'm like, I'm just trying to make this as clean as I can for you. Measuring out the impact lanes, measuring out the vectors, like, okay, I have to go here, I had to impact here, 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 and then here, and, like, doing all the math, green on everything, I go up, do the first attack, hit, he toughs. And there was nobody else in, like, melee range of the first impact attack because of the angle I had to take. Yeah. So I was like, there goes that activation. So, like, that's the... This is, like, this res 2 list, I think, can play into ret. But you need like things, certain things to happen. Like you need to win the roll, and you need the gun carriage not to flub its first attack. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, like it kind of just can death spiral. Yeah, which both of those aren't super big asks, right? I mean, like you have the re-roll to go first, which is arguably better than plus one, unless your opponent rolls a six right out of the gate. Yeah, and the gun carriage has um, line breaker, so it gets to get the uh, the additional die on impact attack rolls, and it knocks down exactly. So like it's not it's not too difficult for you to make something like that happen, but sometimes the dice are just dice. Yeah, with Rivas being steady, or not steady, but D lined, and then like I couldn't really reach a second yep. one just because he put them he put them kind of like in a line, the first one in front. Instead of side to side, kind of like what David did, so like I had to impact so check the he first was one. Trying to get you, I could have like maybe gone for like I tried measuring like if a Menite Archon could kill that first clump, but then it's blocking like the lane for the uh, for the gun carriage, and like because he just double ran like his models, basically his whole army was seven and then twelve and then twelve, so it's about thirty one inches up the board, like. Yeah it's almost outside my AD line. Like it's almost in my square and it's just all there. Mm-hmm. Like you res two something. couldn't do much because there were so many weapon masters just staring him in the face. And like, yeah, he couldn't go be a boss. So like I was able, like some guys were engaging him. Like that's how close up his stuff was. Mm-hmm. So like I had to like punch some stuff to clear himself off so he could repo back. I had to allocate to focus I had to cast Spell Piercer. I up kept Lamentation to try and keep Ghost Walks to a minimum. Because that's also one of the things in Degore Shade where you're like, man, when he made me pick sides, I was like, well, none of this matters to you because you have Ghost Walk. Yep. So, like, you get the advantage of going first and not giving a shit what the terrain is because, like, Ghostly just kind of negates it all. Mm-hmm. So, it was just like, it took so long. It took longer than the first game the first rec game because Resnick was actually under so much threat that I had to play even more cagey and I had to throw up Med Knights like in front of them threshering to try and block lanes. Yeah. So like it was a lot harder than the first one just because there were more bodies. Gotcha. So I imagine that game did not turn out very well for you. No, I ended up losing on like scenario just pulled away. Like I scored a couple points, like I was up and then he contested but then, like, the big thing was, like, since he went first, it, like, I physically could not get to his rectangle zone. Like, Yeah, so he's just going to sit there and slow roll it for most of the game. Yeah, like, he just had a Chimera in the zone. So, like, his speed of six stuff is, like, sidestepping yeah. into my zone. He's, he's got usually, a couple executioners. They're just running around. He's going up, like, two points a turn from the flag and the zone. Yep, and then, like, I couldn't really clear my flag because like wardens were just kind of spaced out mm-hmm. and the victor's only speed four so i couldn't like walk to engage a couple one turn so like i can only get one so like i couldn't like the scenario just slowly drifted away like if it wasn't a live scenario like i had a chance but the fact that it was uh spread the net and he won the roll meant like i'm never getting to his rectangle he's just gonna kind of out attrition me yep and i needed to kill more stuff than what i did like if the gun carriage the gun carriage was in a good position to kind of impact attack through a whole unit. If it had a chance to do that, like maybe I could have pulled out that flank because there was really nothing over there that threatened uh, the Menite Archon and the the Champion of the Wall I sent over there. And the big thing was like bottom of one, I shot with the gun carriage and drifted on the scythe. So like things were looking pretty good turn one. Yeah. And then just like it's just snowballed kind of from there. Bold, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, that means that now you're two and two, and you're going into round five, which this had five rounds. Yes, it did. It very was... long, very long day. Yeah, I love playing three games, two of them back to back after lunch that basically go to clock. Yeah, th- that's no fun at all. So you're going in here, and you're you're. I think right now you're just trying to vie for like maybe some tiebreakers. Basically, like there's so many drops, you really don't know how. Like, you know you're not getting top four, but then, like, oh, you could get top eight and get War Machine weekend points or Warframe weekend points yeah, because you don't know how time. the drops are going to go. So, like, maybe somebody has better tiebreakers than me, but their opponents dropped, so maybe I can beat them on strength of schedule because mm-hmm. it is a five-round event and people are leaving. But then, again, like, my early opponents could drop. So, like, I drove three hours. I'm just going to play the last game. I like the Minnesota people, so I'm like, I'll just play. Yep. So you went into Troll Bloods in the final round. Yep. And it was uh, one of them was Ragnar. Who was the other one? It was Ragnar and Cole Grimma. Okay. And uh, and who was this now? This was Paul. I might be like miss forgetting the name because I can't read my chicken scratch on my sheet. But I'm pretty sure it was Paul from Iowa. Very nice person. Very enjoyable person to play round five. He dropped Ragnar on invasion and i was like well i gotta play harvey there's no gunny too and i was like this is how i want to end my day yeah and your and your grindy day with another grindy list oh yeah that's you know i love grinds yep you live for the grind so you've got harbinger and was this the uh the the scenario that is uh asymmetrical but is not actually asymmetrical uh no i don't think so well that's a bummer that the minnesota people didn't have one of the rounds be the new scenario well, I mean, I think they literally just went through the packet. I'd have to actually pull up the PDF and look at what it looks like. Yeah, that's like the, the lazy TO's way of doing it. Oh, you mean, no, it's not split decision. Split, split decision. decision, yeah. yeah it's that's the one, it's the one they're like, oh, we made an asymmetrical scenario. And it's like, no, it's actually not. No, we did not play that one. We just Yeah, yeah. well, that's a bummer. So, um... You're sitting there, Ragnar. What was the list like? Was it the was it a champion's vengeance list? Yeah. Okay, so those are rough because Ragnar does quite a bit for making them pretty good. But between pulverizer and his feet and all the extra like the arm buff and they they, they get really hard to hit. And if you've got you know double Dunians, which I can't imagine why you wouldn't, um, that gets car- did he have Boomheller three in there? Uh, yes. So really killy and really survivable. Um, and you're doing the same thing too. Like Ragnar could almost arguably be considered like the Trollblood Harbinger. I mean, that's fair. I mean, he's just miserable, miserable meat mountain back again. Yeah. Um, so how, who won the role to go first in this one? I did. So Harby won the role to go first each game. Okay. Thank you, Anastasia. Yeah, that's good. So I just like windmill slam turn one. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I don't want Ragnar getting into the zones. Absolutely not. Yeah, because he'll just sit there and stick it in. And and how what what does battle group look like? Because I've always been I haven't gotten a chance to play it yet, but I really want to know. I'm really curious if like Weight of Stone ever comes up. Uh, He had a Earthborn, a Roadhog. And a pyre troll. I believe okay. that was his battle group. So the Roadhog, at least, is probably going to be getting in there doing some work. Maybe the Earthborn, if he's got the right terrain. Yeah, like, and he had some good terrain on his side. Like, there was water. And, like, we had talked about, like, why does shallow water trigger two of his abilities? Yeah, yeah, right. And, like, there was a building on my side of the zone. So, like, if he's in between the water and the building, he's getting all of them. Mm-hmm. So, like, he wasn't in a bad spot. Uh, there was, like, a building, a couple buildings, like I said, one building on my square or on my circle that Harvey could kind of just hide behind. and the, But there was still a building on the basically symmetrically in the other zone that Harvey could hide behind on that side. So like he was going to give me a building, a bunker for Harvey either way. And he did have Melvin and Mayhem in the list because that and Ragnar is always super spicy. Yeah, Pulperizer on Melvin is, uh, is, is no bueno. And he's friendly faction, so under stone he's arm 22. Yep. And Real hard Herbie's to get. flesh, yeah. Real he hard to a, deal with. Give me a monster. So um, I'm... I can imagine that this game was just quite grindy and back and forth. So can you explain to me the moment that the game kind of broke away from one of, one of you? Uh, the game kind of broke away because we were kind of dancing around our feet again. Yeah. Kind of like what I did against Cole Grandma. I was able to score a point on the left circle. Like I forgot to activate a Crusader the turn before and didn't move it. And he put his Pyrotrol up in the zone with like a Swamp Gobber in the zone. And... The Crusader was in 
uh, Crusader's Call charge range of the Pyre Troll. Mm-hmm. So I was able to send that in, kill the Gobber, and like I was able to score a point because I just threw a unit of initiates in that zone. So like, because we were just grinding away in the middle. Like, there's champions in the middle. Yeah, I have a like a unit of initiates, a Menad Archon, and two Jacks in the middle. And on on each zone, each circle, I have a uh, punch monk just kind of sitting there, and Harvey's just like hiding behind a building. So like that, I think was the big swing is when I finally scored a point, because this was another game where I didn't feat turn two because he his champions didn't threaten that far because the no cold stone, so his champs only threaten nine and a half. Yeah, pretty static. Or is it? It's nine inches, not nine and a half, because they're speed five, charge speed, eight. Speed five, charge eight, and one inch reach, so nine. So they only threaten nine. So what he did was, his turn two, he kind of just ran up. I think he got like a couple charges on the Menad Archon, but like under awe and Ashen Veil, uh, his stuff was mat three, and yeah. he did tens. Like he was just fishing for tens, and like he, they just weren't coming up. So, like, then I feeded top of three once our lines caught him engaged just to stop the second line. And that way, like, he couldn't move up the champions because not all of them were in melee. Mm -hmm. And then he counterfeited. Or, no, he feeded and jammed. And I didn't want to feed before him because his feet works on my feet. So he feeded bottom of two, ran, did a couple charges. I counterfeited, was able to clear a zone because Melvin kind of... He had Melvin and Mayhem in the circle zone on my left while Harvey was on the right, and he used his feet turn to reposition Melvin by running him 14 inches over his stuff to kind of threaten Harvey. So, like, that's kind of what let me score the left side zone because, like, I had a champion of the wall over there, Anastasia, and a Crusader that was able just to clear the zone up. Yeah. So you were able to, you were able to wing the scenario back around a little bit just because Ragnar doesn't really have any good ways of buffing the ability to hit no like he did like i he put an earthborn like i said in the the gap between the water and the building in the right zone but then like i just kind of threw initiates up yeah so like he was still under awe so like he had the boost the first hit he hit and then he had the boost damage because it's only pow 15 at dice minus six and like he he killed one i martyred him at and then he'd have to do it again but this time under weight of stone so then he'd hit boost damage and then let it die just to trigger some angry stuff and uh, like it, the fact that I was able just to score that one side is really kind of what set the got the ball rolling in my direction mm-hmm. yeah as soon as you're eight, like when you're playing two grindy lists like that the person who starts going up points first is probably going to be the one that's going to close it out yeah because like we're both playing kind of bricks but I have more I don't have more tools, but I have more independent tools that can work outside of the brick. Yeah, trolls are very synergy focused where they have to have a lot of things working together to accomplish a goal. Whereas your protectorate list is like, you you don't need to have any synergy to put a punch monk in a zone and exist there for the entire game. Pretty much. And then like the champions of the wall can kind of exist outside of our control area mm-hmm. and just charge off with their power 16 lances. Like one of them softened up the pyre troll and I think I killed it on the charge attack with the Crusader. That was fully loaded. Yeah, lots of independent modules. Yeah. So then, like, I kind of walled off that circle so he couldn't really get to it with the Stone Eater Champions. Like, I kind of just threw the book in the way, threw a jack in the way, and I was like, come at me, bro. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he was able to, like, his following turn, like, he was able to get on my objective. He scored a point, And I believe he was able to contest with, like, a Dunian knot because they were just hiding so far back I couldn't stop them. Yeah. It basically ran into the gap that the Swamp Goober was in the turn before. So, like, he went back. We went back to one the one then. And, like, he was just forcing martyrdom checks because he still needed tens under Ashen and Awe. But then, like, some of the champions weren't in Ashen range punching. So, they only needed eights. Mm-hmm. So, like, he's slowly whittling away my battle group and just forcing martyrdoms. Like, he got Harvey down to five health. Yeah. And, like, that was super scary. But, like, uh, he had... Uh, the Rocket Goober duo. Uh, the Is it Dez and Gubbin? Yeah, he had Dez and Gubbin in the list. So that he could bring Malvin and Mayhem. Yeah, and they were like they were doing work to my choir. Like a couple the first turn they shot, they kinda drifted off in the no man's land, but then like he was catching a couple choirs, so that was triggering martyrdom. I had to keep a champion of the wall, like within nine inches of uh, 
of Vilmont, who was base to base with Harvey pretty much the whole game just for blast immunity. Because like if doesn't govern get any blast damage on me mm -hmm. under mini feet, like I'm gonna die. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you had a a pretty good run for the last round to close. I know it was grindy, but uh, it was it got it came really close down to it because like. He was slowly moving up Melvin and Mayhem around the building, and I was like, wait, if he just flies and runs to engage me, he's going to kill me the next turn. So I had to start spacing out, like, choir and initiates. And there was this one turn where the devout, who had been base-to-base -base with Harvey the whole game too, had to step out of base-to-base -base with Harvey because if I didn't, there was a landing spot between Vilmon and the devout where he could get one-inch melee onto... A Harby. Yep. And, and I was like, if he does that, I just lose because I'm 14 14 and Melvin will just boost one attack and kill me. And then the warhead damage will kill me. Yeah. So you had to, you had to choose that option, but then you left yourself open for hex blasts. Yes. Because Harby was at this was the turn she got down to six health. I pulled from the rack and I was like, okay, we're both low on clock. I need to just not die. So I was like, I'm going to heal 11. Mm -hmm. And went back up to full. And like me, as somebody who hasn't played Harvey in a long time and only played like three or four games with her, yeah, I was like, oh, there's a bunch of champions and a beast in the way. He, I'll be fine. And then he walked up. And he's like, okay, I'm going to hex blast Harvey because the devout's not base to base. And I was like, oh, can you see me? And he's like, yeah, you're on a large base. And I was like, oh, yep. that's news she, to me. She flies that flag real high. Hey, they they hold her down. She's not flying. Yeah. So he did get a fully boosted hex blast with Puppet Master on a no camp Harvey after triggering martyrdom twice. Mm -hmm. So like, because he was trying to clear landing spots for Melvin and Mayhem, I had to martyr them because like if he kills these one dudes melvin can fly and land there or the roadhog can just walk up yep and then like get line of sight to harvey and spray her through the building because he was like on the other side of the building so he couldn't see me mm -hmm. and then so i martyred them i rolled a three for one of them and a two for one so i'd taken seven damage so i'm back down to 10 health he hits the Hex Blast. At first, we thought he just needed a boost to 11 because we weren't factoring in awe. Yeah. But he cranked it. Like, he cranked the hit roll and hit even through awe. So he just needed a re-rollable 11. So dice minus one, I think that's, what, a 75% or a seventy-five percent chance to work? Yeah, roughly. Once you hit. Like, the hitting is what screws the math. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I just needed an 11 on three dice with a re-roll. Like, ah, shit, I've taken worse odds. Yeah, it's it's pretty good. He rolled a 10 for the first damage roll. Like, I was getting ready to shake his hand because I'm like, yep, I lost. Yeah. And then he re-rolled into a 9. And, like, I was like, Harvey lives on 2. Yep. And, like, the, his clock just kind of ran out because he's like, at that point, there was nothing he could do. Yeah, there's no way he can chip any damage in or anything like that. No. Like, that was all he could get on me. And Yeah, it's like his best option would be to, like, use the Earthborn to throw something at you. She couldn't even. Like, I was behind the building. Yeah. And there was nothing that was large base that he could chuck at me. Because well, you only take collateral if it's the same base size. Yeah, that's harsh. But uh, it sounds like... You had a decent day in general. I know when you when you came home, you basically just went to bed. Yeah, it was a long day. Like I was, I did my usual routine thing of like trying to nap on the drive home, but I was driving this time, so yeah, I couldn't I just nap while you drive. Yep. Yep. Well, I I'm I apologize for my inability to land on small rocks. No, it's not your fault, even though it kind of is, but it's fine. Oh. On the drive up there, I didn't tell you like I was kind of like I was like. When I, I'm used to driving, like I, I've driven 21 hours straight once. Like mm -hmm. I just kind of zone out and let the road go. Let the road take you. Exactly. And then I hit a bird. Yeah. <laughs> and it scared the shit out of me. Like Hitting I was, birds would get you, man, because you never see them coming. They just, you, they just are there. Luckily, it like hit my bumper. Okay. And not my windshield. Yeah. So like, I just saw the poor, th like I heard the thud, and then like it just kind of floated up above me, and I was like, well, I'm awake now. Yep. But I didn't hit anything on the drive home, so I was very tired. If I only had a woodland creature to run over to wake me up. Yeah, I know. That's right. You, they they got to sacrifice themselves for the greater good. The greater good of me not crashing my well, car. Well, and then, like, you know, carrion feeders will eat the 
carcass or whatever. So like it's it's the circle of life. I, I was gonna say I don't think the circle of life is me killing things with my car. Well, they wouldn't have died otherwise, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah, it is. So um yeah, so I, I think that kind of rounds out our discussion on Riverfront Rumble. I know that uh, we've kind of been radio silent in terms of like what we what we're with the channel and everything, and it's not for any particular reason. You know, moving, I'm kind of slow rolling it, and the table that we play on's been in my bathroom for two months, so um, it's not weird. It's it's like just up against. Yeah, it's not the like wall. the normal bathroom. It's like the downstairs bathroom. It's, so it's, it's like it's the punish boom boom room basically. Because there's it's there's a toilet and a sink, and then no vent. So it's the place furthest away if you want to have a big loud poop, but um, there's no vent, so you have to kind of live with it. Plus, it's adjacent to the second living room, so if you come out of it after making a big poop, then everyone downstairs gets to know that you're a nasty bee. Yeah. So um, we are looking at getting some games going up again, but the massive updates that are happening have kind of quelled my or kind of put out the fire that was in me after the uh after the riverfront rumble event i just i once war machine states that it's going to be making big big updates with nerfs and changes and all these other things um i kind of just get dejected and don't want to play until those updates are all out so we're looking at what october 20 something 25th to to make all this live so like in my opinion war Mach- i don't want to play war machine right now because it's not like privateer press is basically acknowledged that there are things that are not working and things that are working too well to a point where they need to be nerfed quite a bit. You know, I mean, it's not like they're nerfed into oblivion. They just get adjusted downwards. Right. And, and that's not that I'm not kind of, I'm not disputing that or anything, but what I am saying is that at this current state for the next 25, 26 days, the war machine is in a broken state. In my opinion, it's just in a, it's in a weird state. Like, that was one of the reasons why I almost didn't want to go to Riverfront, because it's like, well, do I really want to drive up, play with stuff, play against stuff I know is getting nerfed, like uh, like Death Archons. Like, how many rounds of Death Archons and Gas before do I want to play into and have to be like, well, I know this is getting nerfed for a reason, but I still have to play into it? Especially since people think that this is like the, the any event that happens between now and the update going live is like the last ride for their broken crap. Yeah, and, like, there's still Dunians for free. Like, every round, except for round one, there was something that's getting nerfed in a list I played into, and including yeah. my list, because I had free initiates. Mm-hmm. So, like, I'm not above it. I played it twice, but, it, like, uh, yeah, round one, there was nothing in Signar that's getting nerfed. And then the free Dunian, round two, Boomy's getting nerfed. And then round three, only the Executioner is getting nerfed and Trident. For Rhett, yeah. even and the Trident, but like that's a, I'm ex- I'm okay with that one. I still think Wardens need something. Because yeah, Wardens they don't are need, a little like, too over. They're a little too step. overperforming. Armor eighteen unyielding. Speed six. Speed six. Speed six is what absolutely kills me. Like yeah. it makes all other medium base infantry look like shit because like they have the speed of Ravagers, and the hitting power of them because they're the same power on the charge, and the survivability of Man of War. Yeah, they're just too good at everything. But when, once the update finally gets, like, solidified or they, they let us know that all the updates have been made live, I'm sure we'll talk about it and probably play some games with those updates, even though we'll have to, like, play off of sheets like we do with some of the CID stuff. So um, yeah, We'll go War Room live. I'm, I have confidence War Room will be updated very fast. I, well, I hope so, yeah, right? But, but um, so, yeah, we're still here. We're still I still enjoy War Machine in general. It's just, like, until the update happens, until it's live and in my hands, I really just don't want to play. Yeah, it just makes... And, like, it, I'm really happy with the update. That was, like, the thing oh, that yeah. shocked no, me the I'm most. Super... Like, when I saw the nerf list, I was ready to be like, oh, man, man, man. But, like, 95% of the stuff, I am super stoked about. Like, they, they were, were good they changes. Were good changes. They were made in, uh, like, they, they needed to happen, right? Yeah. Um, some things like, you know, the Thamorite Archon probably is not, not done properly. Like, yeah, I'm not thrilled about that being Rate of Fire 3. It should probably just be Rate of Fire 2. Yeah. But then like the update that dropped today, you know, like seeing the change to Shield Wall, that's a big, big deal. Yeah. Like I'm super happy with that. Like there's a few outliers like, uh, House Guard guys who can wear Shield Wall 16 inches in a turn. Yeah. Like, but that should just be addressed on its own. But otherwise, like, Cinerators really like it. Man of War really like it. 
the things that needed it like it. And I think that it makes like the Iron Fang pikemen a little bit more interesting, even though they're not the most interesting thing. Like there's something, hopefully something changes with them to, to switch them up a little bit. It's a good start for changes like that changing and then maybe some point reductions. Like, no, I'm definitely excited. Like for most of the stuff and like, I'm excited about primal finally working rules as written mm -hmm. and none of that frenzy garbage. Uh, even if it is going down to plus one, plus one, I'm excited about most of the Archon nerfs. Uh, Void, I still think like uh, the spray could use some cleaning up and that it triggering on the assault. Yeah, the, the Void is the one Archon that I think that got touched weird, you know? It was arguably like, it was either best or second best Archon after the Death Archon. And mm -hmm. like, it was egregious to play against. Like, those sprays, like, well, I you mean, couldn't protect yourself. Yeah, watch them. any of our videos. It's like, no matter, it's it's like the Lord of the Feast all over again, where it's like, whatever you have, you're going to lose it if your opponent wants to take it. Like, that's just, the, you couldn't you couldn't predict the Void Archon threat vectors. It's just too hard. No, there's just too many angles. And like, I'm fine with it, like, losing dual attack. It's just like, it going up nine points and losing dual attack for assault and the assault spray not triggering void walk like it can still walk and spray it can still walk and punch yeah and then void walk away it's just like it got touched a little too many times it's just like is that worth nine points and then yeah. like the problem is like in a lot of lists like minions strange bedfellows scorn yeah because scorn can take voids like you can take double and circle like you can take double death arc no circle can't take voids but, like, there's some themes where you can take double voids or double death archons. And now, in my opinion, like, death archons just straight up replace those. Whereas before in Strange Bedfellows, even though that got nerfed heavily, like, it was a discussion whether you wanted voids or death archons. Now I think it's just, like, you take death. Yeah. Well. Because they're still good, and now they're actually good at killing other archons. Even though, like, they might not be taken as much because all of them, except the primal, got hit. And yeah. the thamorite got buffed. I imagine there might be some adjustments before the, li the update goes actually live, so that's why I think we'll we'll wait to kind of give our full debrief when when things really like hit. I mean, that one will probably be a long, a pretty long episode too. But uh, for now, I think we'll kind of pull this one to a close and uh, just uh, look forward to making more stuff. You know, in the next like couple weeks or so. No, oh, I'm excited for more like more games. I'm excited about things getting better. Like you, like you know me. I'm usually super, I know you're, super you're, optimistic about stuff. You're you're very pessimistic. Yes, that is the fact. And uh, and just to like like everything just kind of looks like it's good. Good good things are coming on the horizon. And I I was probably a little bit more pessimistic about these updates when I when I before they actually you know were re were released to us. But I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how things shake out. No, I am strangely optimistic for once, and it feels weird. Yeah. I, don't, I don't like it. I don't like being full of hope. It's just setting myself up to be let down, but I, I'm hoping they don't let me down. No, I'm sure they won't, Ethan. No. <laughs>